Okay, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Ken Johnson. Um, when I was younger, I, I got saved about 12 and started studying. Um, oh, needs to be a little louder. Yeah, I know. How's that? That better? All right. Okay. So everything I just said, ditto. No, I got saved when I was around 12. I wanted to, uh, after I realized that there are different denominations that teach slightly different things, I wanted to find out for myself what would the correct answer be, even if it's not really that necessary. So I started studying the early church fathers and uh, to find out what they taught. And if you go back to the disciples of the apostles, people that studied under Peter, Paul, John, Jude, Barnabas, people that I, I witnessed, uh, Mary, uh, things like that. There was a church father named Hap Hagasippus, by the way, for instance, that decided he wanted to find out a lot more information about the Gospels, and he went back and interviewed everybody that was alive, somebody's grandfather that would have actually met Paul, or, you know, that kind of stuff, wrote a five-volume set on anything you'd want to know about the Gospels. That's lost to us, unfortunately. Um, but like I say, if anybody finds those, digs them up, let me know. That's what Bible Facts Ministries is for, getting all that extra stuff for you. But uh, going through those things, I noticed that they taught the same doctrine for the first 200 years, and then things begin, began to change. That made me feel better, because if we have eyewitnesses and everybody teaching the same thing, that's got to be correct. So I started uh, doing studies on prophecy and ancient history and those type of things. One thing that I thought was interesting was one of my questions was, how did they turn the Roman Empire into a Christian one? You know, how did that start? Uh, how did they witness? What were their witnessing techniques? And what I thought was interesting, the people back then worshipped Zeus, Hera, Hercules, Saturn, those kind of gods. And what they did simply, is very logical, I wouldn't have thought about it, but they went back and found actual Roman or Greek historical <laughs> records of these people when they were kings and queens a few hundred years after the flood where they died, where they're buried, what kind of uh, bad things if they did at all. And then you go to witness to people, why do you worship Zeus? You know he did this. Well, yeah, you know he's buried in their backyard. People go there every year and make a pilgrimage. Well, yeah. So why do you worship a dead guy in a grave? Become a Christian. And I thought that was really interesting and very, very effective. We could do kind of the same thing with our cults today. You know, why do you uh, follow Joseph Smith and Mormonism? How did he die again? He was in jail and he was lynched. What's the story behind that? Get the actual document, uh, you know, records, those kind of things. Uh, one of my favorite things to say to a Jehovah's Witness is, what, what do you think about pyramidology? You know, the idea that the pyramid in, in Egypt tells prophecy, that kind of stuff. They usually say, well, we think that's demonic. You know, and that's cool either way. And I'll say, well, but do you realize that your founder believed in pyramidology and wrote a four-volume book on the subject? So was the founder demonic and the current one's okay, or was the, current, the founder okay and the current leadership demonic? Either way, why don't we go, both go become a Baptist? <laughs> you know, there's something not right there somewhere. But that's the kind of stuff that the, the church fathers would do, and that's the same thing we ought to do, open and honest. You're following a cult. Why is it considered a cult? Here's the evidence for it. You know, those kind of things. Uh, in, the, in the process of doing that, it intrigued me that there are records for Zeus and Hera and Hercules and these people that are around. They were actually people that lived after the flood and died and was buried. That's kind of interesting. There was a church father in 250 AD uh, named Cyprian who said that uh, you can actually still go to the tomb of Zeus. They still milk make pilgrimages there every year, the few people that still worship him. And he's known to be buried on the north side of the city of Gnosis on the island of Crete. Uh, some of the legends are connected to be true. And again, you know, the grave is clearly marked, so why do you worship a dead guy? You know, and those kind of things. And that's very, very intriguing for me. One of the other things that some of the church fathers taught was that the second coming might happen in the year 6,000. So, even though we're not supposed to set dates, my first question was, can we figure out what today is? You know, 
just to you know figure this out. So I always loved, my father and I both like to go back in Genesis and look up the dates and try to figure out things. But I started using some of the old scrolls that they talked about, uh, Book of Jasher, Seder Alam, some of those type of things that we've made available for the public. But uh, just to go on with this then, we wanted to create a basic timeline, uh, use the history of the Jews in addition to the Bible, and then wherever we're supposed to be or those people are supposed to be, the descendants of Noah, go to those places and see if there's any records or legends that match what we're being told. And that's how I started off with the first book I ever wrote, The Ancient Post-Flood History. So starting with the testimony of the disciples of the apostles is what we really want to focus on in those ancient history books. Uh, reliable documents, we want to make sure to use those. First of all, the Bible. I use the King James Version, although in the Old Testament it doesn't make too much difference. Book of Genesis, mainly from the Hebrew. If we had time, we could talk about the Septuagint and why the numbers are different, and there's a very easy way to figure out which set of numbers is correct. Very, very easy. Uh, there's the Book of Jasher, which is a history book written by Jews. Uh, the oldest scroll that I have is 3,500 years old. Most of you are familiar with Josephus. He was a historian that wrote about 70 AD. And then there's the Seder Olam, which is a Jewish history book written about 169. Uh, it took off uh, basically just the numbers, the chronology from Genesis up through Kings, uh, whatever the rabbis of his time period said, and tried to build a chronology. Did a really good job. In the process, mentioned that Daniel chapter 9 was fulfilled, the Messiah did come even though the official comment from the rabbis is that didn't happen and it doesn't point to a messiah, it points to the destruction of the second temple. He went ahead and told that story and was very respectful, but then showed you in the back of the book why that really couldn't have happened that way. And again, because it messes up the chronology. Very interesting thing. If you go to the Talmud, which is the, the normal uh, big encyclopedia of, of Judaica, it will quote, misquote actually, the Seder Olam and say that it says that the Messiah didn't come. But it's interesting to know that apparently he did. And it's and interesting to, just in witnessing the Jews, just using the Tanakh or the Old Testament, uh, the book of Daniel says that the Messiah would come and then a prince would destroy the city. Everybody agrees that was Titus. So if Jesus wasn't the Messiah, somebody was, and they came before 70 AD, or Daniel was a liar or God, knowing it wouldn't happen, sent an angel to tell Daniel what he knew to be a lie to begin with. God's not a liar. God cannot lie. And so the prophecies are correct. But it's interesting to note that we're actually giving, and we'll, we'll be talking about this tomorrow, some of the timeline prophecies. There are a few prophecies where you can start, calculate the date, and come up with an exact date on when something occurred. The uh, death of the Messiah is one. 1948, 1967 events are others that we'll talk about tomorrow. But uh, you can see this just in Exodus chapter 12. It says when the Exodus occurred, it was to the day, 430 years to the day when God promised Abraham this would happen. God's not in the business of saying, you know, whatever I get up today, you know, it's the exact time. Anyway, we take those as historical primary documents that in the Bible, and then the other ancient uh, secular histories from that period uh, of wherever we're looking at, Egypt or, or wherever, and try to uh, put the pieces together. So just to do that, let me just show you a chart real quick. And I'm sure you guys have done this before. In Genesis chapter 5, there's a genealogy. Starts off with Adam was created, and Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. Now we have Cain and Abel, of course, but Abel's killed, and Cain runs off and is banished. And then the genealogy continues with Seth. Seth was so many years old when he had his boy. If you tally those up, it's 235 years after creation. Now, I get asked questions like, well, we don't know how long Adam was in the Garden of Eden. No, I don't, and for this purpose, don't really care. He was created. He spent a certain amount of time in the Garden. He was banished. He spent the rest of his time outside the garden. Either way, when he was 130 is when his child was born. So there you go. So we go on, and there's lots of reasons why, mainly with uh, evolution, that people keep telling you the Bible's inspired, but you can't trust these numbers. 
and it's just amazing. And that actually is what the church fathers had prophesied. Later on, as we get toward the end times, the, the Hindu concept of evolution, reincarnation type stuff would enter the church. And we have that in secular society with evolution saying we've been here for billions and billions of years. And there's enough creation science around to show you how the earth had to be uh, less than that. Uh, there's lots of things. And I'm not a scientist, and I don't want to misspeak on it. I'm just a historian saying, you know, there's ancient records that say the same thing. You know, like there's the scientific, scientific theories of the canopy. I can show you in some of these ancient texts, the canopy is actually mentioned. So it's not really a theory. I can't prove that it was existed, but I have historical evidence. And I don't know why we can't trust this historical evidence like any other historical evidence. So anyway, we can look at these now. In Genesis chapter 5, all of these are given. In Jasher chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, these are given. And in the Seder, it starts out in the very beginning tallying them up. And you can tally them up to the date. And we get to the flood occurring uh, when Noah was 600 years old. So if we tally all those up, the flood occurred 1,656 years after creation. No more, no less. Now, there has been some debate on are these years 360-day years, 365 years. So yeah, the calendar was supposed to get messed up. It did. There's lots of questions, but basically, here is the chronology. Uh, no matter how you do that, it's not billions and billions of years. <laughs> Either that or you've got a very weird calculator. Okay, so that's one of the first numbers you'd want to memorize is 1656, date of the flood. By the way, the, the Jews still, when you look at the Jewish calendar, they call it AM, which is Anno Monday, the year of the Lord. We go by AD, the year of our, uh, well, the year, AD is the year of the Lord, rather, when the, Jesus came. <laughs> they go by Anno Monday, which is the year of the world. So if they're if their calendar was correct, then 57, whatever this year is, years ago is when the world was created. If our calendar is correct, then 2013 years ago is when Jesus was born. You know, so. But again, the calendars could be slightly off. Going to the next one here, here's from the flood to Abraham. And again, it starts off in Genesis chapter 11 when it said, Our fax it was born two years after the flood. Okay. And then he was so many years old when his child was born, and that was Sheila. Uh, so you, again, starting with 15, 1656, add two years, add all these other dates up, you go all the way down to Abraham. Same dates are given in Genesis chapter 11. They're given in Jasher chapter 7 and the Seder chapter 1. So we get to tally these up. So Abraham was born 1,948 years after creation, or AM. And that's interesting, too, because the nation of Israel was reborn in the year AD 1948. Abraham, the father of the Jews, was physically born in the year AM 1948. I'm not saying there's an embedded prophecy in there or something. I've looked for one. <laughs> Can't find it. But it is very interesting. Yeah. Coincidence, yeah. When two things are connected and nobody wants to admit them. So anyway, 1948. I just thought that was kind of amazing. Again, we're just building a basic timeline. Now, Abraham to the Exodus. This is where it gets tricky if you're just using Scripture because Scripture begins to, uh, about the end of Genesis, stop giving dates uh, in the same way. Uh, but there is references to King in Kings and Chronicles and other places. We know Abraham was born. Uh, he was given a prophecy when he was 70 that uh, 430 years later, the, basically what we call the Exodus would occur, and his children would be in this for 400 years. 30 years later, he had Isaac. And uh, Isaac was, and you can tally these up again. Uh, Isaac was born, and then Jacob was born, and then Joseph was born, and then he went into Egypt. And it says when he was 30 is when the Pharaoh raised him up and they predicted the seven-year famine. You know, so at that point, we can get into all of these things. So Abraham being born in 1948, and again, dates are the same in Genesis all the way up through Genesis 47, the dates given in Jasher and in the Seder, in the chapters. So it's nice having confirmation. Jasher, by the way, has three consecutive timelines running through it. 
and sometimes you will slip a digit like you do in any ancient de uh, document. But when they tally up the, the figures, that all comes out. So we've got where Joseph was enslaved. He became what I call vice pharaoh. The seven-year famine began. Uh, Jacob migrated into Egypt, and then Jacob died, and then Joseph died. Those can all be found very clearly in Genesis. Genesis, Jasher, and the Seder. So we get up to that being in 2309. Well, in, in uh, I think I have that on here. Anyway, uh, in um, Galatians 3.16 and 17, Paul mentions that the law which came after cannot annul the grace which was given by the promise to Abraham, and that was 430 years. So Paul is telling us the same thing. It was 430 years between the promise given to Abraham and the exodus from Egypt. And his children were enslaved in lands that were not theirs, theirs, which is Egypt and Canaan, for a period of 400 years. And you can tally up these and uh, look them up. So that gives us the exodus occurring in 2448 on the AM scale. And so far you're saying, yeah, that's really nice, but that doesn't tell me anything. Where was it BC? Uh, and then we've got Moses dying and then Joshua finally dying. The book of Jasher ends at Joshua's death. And the Seder goes on up, like I said, to the destruction of the second temple. So just to let you know, there's different sources. The dates all agree, and so we should have a good chronology. So here's an example. We're going to spend most of our time on this. Everybody wants to know who was the pharaoh where Joseph was, and who was the pharaoh of the Exodus, and how can we calculate this? Because you look at the Egyptian history, and it goes back, I think, seven or 8,000 years which is not possible, so something's not quite right. How do we reconcile these? And it's actually pretty easy to do. It's just that nobody wants to do it. So if the flood occurred in 15, or 1656, and Jasher gives us you know, the dates of he was so, so many years old when he went down into Egypt, so he was in there at 2023. 20, Joseph, when he was 30, began ruling. That would have been 2228. And of course, we know the Exodus is 24. 48. So that gives us a time period, which we want to really focus on, is slightly after the flood. Between the flood and the exodus, we have 792 years. Okay, so we have in Egyptian history basically four kingdoms. There's the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, the new kingdom, and then modern history. And a lot of people try to put the exodus up in the middle kingdom somewhere. But looking at this, it's exactly 792 years after the flood. Now, in the Old Kingdom, if we just look at the Old Kingdom, we assume it's sequential, then that's where we get uh, uh, a time period that is vastly more than this, like 1,400 years or so. so. But what's interesting is if you talk to an Egyptologist, not about numbers, but you ask him, what happened to the Old Kingdom? They tell you, we don't know. Something very strange happened. I've heard people say it must have been meteor showers or whatever, but it was like in a matter of like days almost, the kingdom was wiped out. But we have no idea what happened. Yeah, I do. I've got, a, I've got an ancient document that tells me exactly what happened. It's called Genesis. But anyway, what we see in from these documents is that Ham uh, fathered the, 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 the people that would be in the African nation, one of his sons uh, founded Egypt, Mitzrayim. And it's interesting, these names are normally the, the standard Hebrew names for these countries. Egypt is Mitzrayim in Hebrew. Mitzrayim was the guy that founded it. He built Memphis, and according to the ancient records, was killed shortly thereafter by a hippo, which I thought was very strange. Then I came to understand that hippos in Africa are actually a little more dangerous than alligators. Alligators eat people, but you always see them coming. Hippos take a big, deep breath, go down under the water, and stay there for an hour. And you're cro you don't think there's anything there, and you're just crossing, and you scare them, and they, they don't eat people. They're, they are vegetarian, but they, they're huge. You scare them, they bite you. Then they spit you out, and they go on their way, but you're dead. So uh, hippos, <laughs> hippos are nothing to mess with. So it would be like if uh, we had elephants over here, but elephants were very, very clumsy. That would be very dangerous. 
Anyway, so th there's a lot of the information on these documents, and we'll go through and look at a few of them. But there's an interesting uh, uh, thing. We've got the kings of Egypt, and not pharaohs yet, but just kings like everywhere else. And there was a guy, and Jasher gives this story. His name was Rikayan. He was an Assyrian. He came down to basically find a way to make money. He realized that the Egyptians did not have swords and spears made out of metal yet. So he goes back up, hires a small team of mercenaries. He goes down and figures out what their customs are. They have to bury their dead in a certain way to a certain god in a certain place. He finds the place, camps out, and he won't let anybody bury their dead until they pay him a fee to go in and bury the dead. And it's really interesting. He becomes very rich doing this. And he probably would have been attacked and killed when the king found out, but he gave a, a large amount of the money to the king, became very friendly with the king. Then he went further down south and started another dynasty. And that's the beginning of the second dynasty, which ruled from Elephantine. So the interesting thing about it is, and by the way, Pharaoh in one of the ancient Egyptian dialects means taxer of dead people. And I thought that was interesting. It's like he, he found a way to make people pay taxes after they died. And it got shortened to Lord of the Dead, you know, and we think of some weird occultic thing, but according to the history books of the Jews, this is what happened. So we have these two things. So now we have all this 1,400-year basic amount of time put into two different groups, one ruling from Memphis, Upper Egypt, and Lower Egypt, and the other ruling from Elephantine. And there's a lot of other stories we could put in with this. But that basically sets this in that 792-year time frame. So it's amazing. So now all we have to do is find out like where Joseph went. Was it Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt? Plug in the times, find out which pharaoh was ruling, look at the documents for that pharaoh, look for some Jewish or Hebrew type magician, soothsayer, whatever they would have called it, and see if there's records like that. And there are. So it looks very, very interesting. So looking at Egyptian documents, not very trustworthy, but if we already know the time period that they're in, we know how to calculate the dates, we're just looking for names and dates, basically. Uh, there are three things we can look at. Manatheo is an ancient Egyptian historian, and he gave a set of, uh, of uh, chronology of kings. It's interesting. He has a set of kings that rule before the flood. There's 10 of them, very, very similar to the ones in our Bible. Only he's got them ruling for, for 30 some thousand years, you know, that kind of a thing. So the numbers are off, but the amount of people are the same. I thought it was interesting. And then he's got the chronology going on up through that. So we can use that as a, as a base. Uh, and then there's the Turin papyri we'll talk about in a little bit. But the Temple of Seti in Abydos, Egypt is amazing. Don't go on the internet and query Abydos. You'll get 100 sites for Stargate. It's amazing how they take these ancient names, put them in something, and now everybody's looking for something else. But Abydos, Egypt was a capital. Uh, it was uh, dug up by Sir Flounders Petrie in the 1930s. And uh, what's interesting about this, here's a picture of it, and you can't really see from the picture, but on the walls are carved the information from the first 19 dynasties. So the old kingdom ends at the sixth dynasty. So it goes on up to that. It was commissioned by a pharaoh in the 23rd dynasty, and we've got the first 19 dynasties on it. Again, names are always going to be different because of the Tower of Babel. We're, we're told that. But let's put these together. This is really amazing. Now, the pharaoh, the, not the pharaoh of the Exodus or the pharaoh of the end of the sixth dynasty, but the, the father, the next to the last pharaoh of the sixth dynasty or of the old kingdom was what we call Pepi II. Okay, so Jasher says this next to the last pharaoh started his reign at the, at the age of six years old. Somebody else would have been, you know, but that's officially when he became king or pharaoh at the age of six. And he ruled for 94 years and died. Jasher makes a comment at that point and said he's the longest ruling pharaoh ever to that point. 94 years is a long time. Now we get to the temple of Seti in Abydos, Egypt, and we look up the next to the last pharaoh of the old kingdom. Totally different name, as we would suspect, but it mentioned he died at the age of 100. Now what's 94 plus 6? Interesting. 
And there's actually a spot on the wall in the Temple of Seti that has a comment that says that the next to the last pharaoh is the longest ruling pharaoh of the entire old kingdom. That to me is amazing. You've got Jewish history, Jasher, cooperating with Egyptian documents. What else does it say? Well, the pharaoh of the Exodus would have been Pepi II's son. Uh, he's usually referred to as Nefekiri the Younger, or I'm going to try to say this right, Atemesef II. Uh, according to those text records, he ruled for one year. And then something happened, and all of Egypt was obliterated, and nobody knows how. All of Egypt was destroyed. Very, very interesting. The old kingdom came to an end. Normally, when you're invaded and taken over, like the Babylonians took over the Assyrians and then the Persians took over the Babylonians. There's records of that. So who took over the Egyptians? Nobody. They just went. So nobody knows what happened. Now here's uh, information from the book of Jasher. The last pharaoh, the pharaoh of the Exodus, they called him Erechim Echoz. And Echoz is a word for small or short. Basically, they were making fun of him. They were calling him Shorty. He was supposed to have been a dwarf, which I thought was interesting. I've seen some um, movies about the Exodus, and you've got the king being a, a bald guy that's like maybe six, seven feet tall, big guy. I always thought it was kind of funny. But it's, according to what it says, he ruled for one year, and all of Egypt was destroyed. His wife's, wife's name was Gaduda and she ruled alone after him. Now, this is a male-dominated society. Women are basically bought and sold. They do not tell you what to do. No queens would ever be ruling in that respect. So for the fact for her to be ruling means most, if not all, the guys are gone. Probably drowned in a Red Sea somewhere, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting. It also mentions her firstborn child had died. And people always ask, how come the pharaoh didn't die in the plagues? According to the book of Jasher, Pepi II was um, very, very ill. He, he couldn't be uh, uh, entombed or mummified because his body was very putrid. A lot of people thinks, uh, think that he had a uh, sexually transmitted disease that basically started eating up his whole body. And to go along with that, it kind of fits because it says that his firstborn child was an idiot. And not to be mean or anything, but just saying that he just was not capable of ruling. The second born child was extremely intelligent, capable, but he was a dwarf. And so, again, this fits. So the pharaoh of the Exodus would not have been a first born child. His first born child died, in the, ex or died in, the, in the plagues. So it's really interesting. A lot of questions are answered when you look at some of these ancient texts. Is there any records of this? Any pictures? Any dwarf pharaohs? Anybody ever find anything like that? Well, yes, I guess they have. Here is a picture of a, not a very good one, but it's of a six dynasty type person, not necessarily a pharaoh. It's not, it doesn't have a name inscribed on it or anything, so we're not sure what it is. But I thought that was interesting. There is another more famous statue, and this is a picture of it here. And the inscription at the bottom says that this is Seneb, the servant of Pepi II. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, the servant apparently was his second-born child. So yes, there are a lot of extra-biblical documents that show some of these things. So that's the Temple of Seti and some of the things we see about it. There's also a black granite stone in a museum in Ismailia, Egypt. It's a really interesting thing. It actually records. It doesn't say, because it's a piece of something, it doesn't say which pharaoh we're talking about, but it mentions pharaoh's army drowning in what they called a whirlpool. I thought that was interesting. I don't know why the Egyptians would be way out at sea drowning in a whirlpool, but you know, according to the Bible, they were crossing the Red Sea, and God just did that. I thought it was amazing. In my mind, if Whirlpool is a good way of saying it, I can see the walls collapsing and some people almost making it to the shore. So God doing this, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, so there are records of the Pharaoh's army dying. There's another thing called the laden papyri. 
And it definitely talks about how the sixth dynasty was destroyed, or the end of the old kingdom. Very interesting. And it's available online, and you can get it and look at it. If we just knew some of these things, it would be amazing. It mentions all of Egypt was destroyed. It mentions there was some mystical figure type person that somehow turned the water to blood. And I thought it was interesting, again, you've probably heard people say it probably wasn't blood. It probably became blood red because of some, you know, asteroid that flew over it. You know, they make up all these things. It might have been, I don't know. It says blood, I would assume blood is blood. It doesn't say blood red, you know, but it might mean that. And here's an Egyptian document using their word for blood. They don't say blood red either. They say blood. So... Again, I'm, I'm, I'm for interpreting the scripture however it says it. Not to, not to argue about it, though. But it also talks about hail coming down and lice and frogs being everywhere. And it mentions that the slave labor force just got up and left and took all the jewels and gold with them. <laughs> that would just economically destroy the country. And it does mention a time of thick darkness. Have you guys ever went in one of those... Uh, things where you ride through an underground cave and sometimes you get way down there and they turn the lights out and they say put your hand right in front of your face can you and you can't see a thing it's pitch black same thing here it got so dark people just sat down and couldn't really move I mean you can't see anything then the darkness left well we know there's a lot more plagues than that but this is all that the tour or the you know the tour, the laden papyri mentioned and I just thought that was interesting so if you plug these together, again, see what we've done is you take the Bible as a literal history, you look at other Jewish history books that maybe fill in some dates or tell you who was related to who, you go to Egypt and see if you can find information like that or wherever it is we're looking for, and you find information. It's amazing. I found out that a lot of places they have history and it only goes back so far and then that's it. But then if you press the, the historians, Almost every place has what they call a chronicle, which tells how they got started. But they don't like to talk about chronicles because they all go back to like a flood and stuff like that. So it's, it's been messed up by Christians in the Middle Ages. That's what happened. It's like, yeah, that's, that's an interesting trick. But there's a lot of these type of things. So just to kind of look at dates to memorize, creation would have been the year one on the Jewish calendar. Noah's flood, 1656. The birth of Abraham in 1948, the Exodus in 2448, and we haven't really talked about it, but you can figure it up to the dedication of King Solomon's temple in 2935, and then the destruction of King Solomon's temple was in 3338, and all the ancient sources would agree on those dates. Interesting thing about it is because I think almost all historical um, um, archaeologists and historians today that are secular uh, at least they believe there was a Babylon, so that's something for them. Uh, but they say that the Babylonians came and destroyed King Solomon's temple about 586 or 587 B.C., give or take a year. Plug that in with 3338, and you come up with an approximate date for Exodus, or I mean for the creation, rather. And so my date would be 20, or 3925 B.C., you're probably familiar with Bishop Usher, who did 4004, so we're all in the same ballpark. I thought it was interesting uh, from Eusebius uh, and many other church historians throughout the ages, when they look at the Greek text, they have one set of numbers. When they look at the Hebrew, they have another set of numbers. But the creation date, when they look at the Hebrew numbers, whatever ones they have, almost always comes out in, within 100 years. So it's somewhere in 39 to 4,000 B.C. It's pretty amazing, which is what our Bible tells us. This is ancient post-flood history, and I did this with Egypt, but I also went ahead and added another, uh, found information for about another 20 or so different places. So just to give you uh, some more information on these, uh, I break it up, there, there's a section in the Book of Jubilees that will tell you Japheth's area, Shem's area, and Ham's area. And it's really neat because it will go and start from this mountain range to this river, to this city, to this mountain range, and go on. And half of those aren't there anymore, but half of them are. 
And basically you can see where Europe is, is Japheth and the Middle East from like uh, Israel to India would be Shems and then Ham would be basically Africa. It mentions which nation got which island like Turkey, uh, off of Turkey and those kind of things. Uh, but there's a section, I, I thought it was interesting, again, if you go back to the old chronicles of the Anglo-Saxons uh, with England, there's actually five different very ancient scrolls that will run them back to Noah. They, they go all the way back to a guy that colonized the entire planet. He survived a flood. Usually they have different names. Sometimes it's very, very similar to Noah. Uh, Noe, Noah, something like that. And he would have so many generations. Uh, my family is from Denmark, and in Denmark, we anciently worshipped uh, Thor and Odin and those guys. And what's interesting about it is uh, I found record that apparently Odin was uh, 20th generation from Noah through, through Japheth. And apparently he was a very mighty king or he wouldn't have all this legend behind him. And so it's interesting how my people, even up as far as the 1100s A.D., we're still sacrificing on a temple off the island. And it's just kind of interesting to see those things. Uh, I always thought it was interesting, though. If you were a pagan and you worshipped Odin, and you know what the legends are. Odin, one of the legends is that Odin was trying to get more power through his sorcery, and he, something happened, and he had his eye pecked out. Okay, so... That story right there tells me apparently he's not the almighty creator. <laughs> Why was he trying to get more powerful? And how did the creator have an accident and get his eye pecked out? Trying to get more. It's just interesting. I mean, at that point, I might still believe in Odin, but I ought to say, you know, I bet you there's somebody higher than Odin. Just logical. You can, and again, that's the same type of stuff that the church fathers would do. Okay, well, let's assume that that's right, but he couldn't have been the original. Well, I guess not. I can show you who the original guy is. And then we can go back in records and find your God, and maybe even find where he's buried, because he's not a God. Sorry. <laughs> but that's the kind of things that they did to witness to people. Very, very amazing. There's a chronicle of Armenia and a chronicle of Georgia that traces their colonization back to Hike. And he was... Uh, uh, direct descendant, like I think fourth generation from Magog. And there's an interesting story behind it because he lived with his father and his brothers, but he got, he, he was very obedient uh, as a son should be, but he just could not handle staying in that area when there was some sort of a mad guy trying to enslave people and build a large tower. And he just had enough. So he took up and he left and he found a place where he could probably be okay and started his colony. We find the same kind of legend with the Chinese. They trace their stuff back to the Yellow Emperor of China. He apparently got fed up with some guy who was a maniacal person building a tower and left to go the other direction to find a place where he wouldn't be bothered. And it's interesting how so many of these go back to a flood and legends of the Tower of Babel. Sometimes they're real close, sometimes they're kind of off. But there's over 600 different flood legends. Just about every people on the planet have a flood legend. Sometimes they're saved by hiding in a, in a cave in a mountain. Usually they get in a boat and are saved. Sometimes animals are with them. Sometimes they're not. But it's just amazing. Um, again, the chronicles are there. Britain traces its lineage back to Brutus, who colonized it. He was a descendant from Aeneas. Aeneas is mentioned in the book of Jasher. We know the timetable and his relationship with the sons of Esau and uh, with the Israelites. Not related to the Israelites in any way, but it's just interesting. There is a, um, an ancient, now, nowadays they're calling it a legend, it's called the Rape of the Sabians. It's a part of Italian history. Supposedly Rome was founded and there was a tribe that needed wives, but they were kind of like cutthroats and Rome decided they would not intermarry with them at all. So at a certain point, they came and stole enough women. It started a small war, which lasted 11 years, by which time everybody had grandsons. And the, the people said, we are going to put the wives and the grandsons on the front lines. 
you decide if you want to stop the war. Like it or not, we're related now. And that was the end of it. Well, the book of Jasher mentions that war, mentions that it started when Abraham was 91 years old. So it mentions other wars going on in Italy and other places. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I think this morning or sometime, that some people are saying that uh, the Gog Magog invasion in Israel is not Russia, it's somebody else. You know, there's always these different legends. Jasher actually goes back and mentions that Magog's great grandson, and it names him, was the first Scythian king. And it names the first three Scythian kings. And then you can see the name is radically changed, so you know the Tower of Babel event had occurred. And it's just interesting to see these things. So there's enough records to know. Uh, prophecies of Gog and Magog invading, that's Russia. There's no doubt about it. The ships of Tarshish were to be the first to bring Israel back for the second time, according to Isaiah. The British did that. That's an old name for Britain. There's no doubt about it. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Javan is uh, Greece. So when you look at the old names in the Bible, find out what those are. And in some cases, we could be talking about the people that went somewhere else. So there's, there's a bit of debate on that, it's the, the country or the people. But you can narrow it down. The closer you get to it, it becomes obvious what the prophecy is talking about. But there's legends about all of these. Uh, Germany, France, uh, which kids started what? Norway, Denmark, as I mentioned. Um, Greece is interesting because it mentions uh, Zeus, uh, Hercules, these people. Hercules is supposed to be buried on a coastal city in Spain. Um, uh, Zeus or Jupiter is buried in Crete, those type of stuff. And they were still being worshipped as late as 250 AD, according to the Church Fathers. But again, these were just people. And Venus, uh, the goddess of love and war, most of us are familiar with her. She was a queen on the island of Cyprus, according to the ancient histories. There was a war. Most of the guys were wiped out. She taught the women of Cyprus to practice prostitution as a means of gain. Not in a religious sense, just prostitution for money. And so she got the legend of being, you know, a queen could start wars. At the same time, the, one of the earliest post-flood madams. And I thought that was interesting how somehow that gets changed to Venus, the goddess of love. You know, again, some of these people existed. The legends are based on accurate facts. But again, and a lot of these things don't exist anymore. But we're looking at church fathers from 2,000 years ago, like you're looking through a microscope. And you're looking at them looking through a microscope, looking at history that goes back 2,000 years from their time. And the comments that they give are amazing. Incidentally, this is what helps you. And everything is connected. Uh, I've had friends that were heavily into astrology. Now, in astrology, the idea is we look at the planets the way they were when I was born and the way they are today, and see how they crisscross, and it's supposed to tell me something. If Mars is in a certain position, I'm going to have strife. If Venus is in a certain position, my love life might improve, or go down the tubes, or something. But if you stop and look at that, if Mars was a guy that was a warrior, Venus was a, a lady who was a madam, and she's dead and buried. And Zeus, the greatest of all gods, was a king, he happens to be buried on Crete. What does that have to do with me? All of a sudden, it's not the magic stars up there, but that's based on dead people. So astrology becomes a joke at that point. And you can trace it back to the pre-flood version, too. The rabbis tell you what the pre-flood pagan religion was, and it's a little bit different than what we have today. But uh, there's a lot of information on that, and it just keeps going back and forth. So this helps you find out evidence for the Bible. It helps you get out of pagan tricks that we have today and those kind of things. Information on Russia, Italy, and those. Shem's son, we'll talk about that just for a little bit. Um, the Arab nations are mentioned. Ishmael had 12 tribes. They kind of intermingled, but that's where some of the Arab nations came from. Um, India is mentioned. Iran is the Persians. So we can go back. The Persians came from Elam. Elam was one of the sons of Shem. Uh, we know the history about Israel. That's very, very well detailed. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, China is interesting. There is an ancient legend that says that uh, there was a, a, a god, that one god, that created everything. 
and he was worshipped in a temple in Beijing with what was called a border sacrifice for thousands of years. And it was still going on when the communists took over uh, this last century. I thought that was interesting. Uh, in addition to other gods and other spirits and stuff, but this one god that created everything, somehow something happened, they don't know exactly what, but the world was destroyed by a flood. And two people survived, and these two people populated everybody that's here. Their names were Fuxi and Nuwa. I thought that was interesting. Nuwa I recognized. Now, according to the Book of Jasher and, and other historical uh, records, Noah's wife was Nema. Uh, she was the daughter of Enoch, one of the prophetesses. Um, but it's interesting how the names change. And in this case, Fuxi was the guy and Nua was the girl. But I thought it was interesting. At least Noah, Nua is kind of there. But it's interesting because it goes further and it says that they had uh, three august ones, three great children that divided the world. And then it goes on and says that one of their, one of their um, descendants, or one of their children rather, five generations down, the guy was named after him and he was called Shun. And he became known as the Yellow Emperor because he's the one that got fed up with the guy in the tower and all the junk and left to go to the Yellow River and found his own kingdom. And that starts the, the oldest Chinese uh, set of records as far as history goes for that dynasty. And again, it's really interesting to see those kind of things. Uh, Shun was named after somebody, so his name would be similar to his great, 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 great grandfather. I'm guessing Shem. You know, Shem and Japheth would have kind of intermingled at that point over there in that corner. So there's lots of different things like that. Now, we don't know if all of these legends are true, but again, we know the Bible's true. We know the history books of the Jews, like Jasher, for instance, is mentioned by the Bible. So probably not perfect, probably been messed up a little bit through time. But the dates are real similar. The names are real similar. There's enough of them. You go to those countries, and you find similar records. So it's really amazing. Uh, let's see. Going to Hamson, there's African nations. We know the story about Canaan, finding, founding Canaan. That's in the Bible in this starting of Egypt. The Sodom and Gomorrah, who started those, are, are mentioned in Jasher. So it just goes on. It's interesting, uh, if we had time to, to talk about it a little bit, just staying with Egypt. Uh, when you go look at Joseph going in and, and talking with one of the pharaohs, there's two pharaohs you know, from two different countries at that particular time. And it was one of the Dozier's, actually. And it was interesting that Dozier had somebody build one of the step pyramids. And one of the, uh, the names match a lot with the name given to Joseph in, uh, in Genesis. But it's interesting, there's a lot of legends about this guy who was some sort of a Hebrew magician or Hebrew diviner type thing that he did predict a seven-year famine. It was really, really interesting. And he was a very highly respected person in the court. There's actually a legend that goes further. He was called Imhotep, by the way. And I know you guys have probably seen the movie where the, the mummy and the evil guy is Imhotep, you know, so that's not Joseph, but it's based on that same legend. Uh, Imhotep lived to be 110 years old, same as Joseph did in the Bible. And when he was around 100, he was asked to show his worth to the court to still be, you know, like a, a ruler. And he was asked to create a little resort in the middle of a desert. And he took the challenge on, and this little resort is, and I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but it's in the book, uh, it's, it's still there. And what happened is somebody built a feeder canal from the Nile River so many miles into this man-made basin, and now it's a little oasis. The Arabs call the feeder canal uh, the River of Joseph. And it's interesting, and it was built by Imhotep during the reign of Dozier. So, but you go to some of the people in the area and you say, well, you know, who built this? Oh, somebody way back when. It's so old, nobody knows anything about it, except for the legends, which of course can't be true because we don't want to believe that stuff. <laughs> so it's interesting. We have records of Joseph and things that he built that are still around, or, you know, had built. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, we've got lots of things like that in here. So. The whole idea then is just to look at these things and see 
in different parts of the country, uh, things that match up with the Bible, match up with the Hebrew records, and the, the key to matching them is these other historical documents from the Hebrews. So works out very good there. So for this, my book is Ancient Post-Flood History. The Seder Olam and the Book of Jasher are two really old history books. And of course, you probably have Josephus too. Josephus is about 70. Jasher actually is about 3,500 years old. Goes back to about 1400 BC. People ask me, well, people ask me here, um, how do we know what's the history on Jasher? And the history is that it's always been kept by the Jews. None of these books are ever canonical. We have the Bible. The Bible is uh, put together the system of books by the prophets. The prophets proved who they were by doing miracles. And what they put in it is what they put in it. These other books are mentioned by it, but not to be added to it. So very straightforward. I believe in the inerrancy of scripture and its inspiration, but I also want to do what it tells me to do. So if it says this is not a part of the Bible, but it's interesting reading, I want to go read it. But supposedly it was taken by the Jews before the destruction of the temple and taken to Spain. So it's been there in the Sephardic community for a long time. Some other books we produce, Translations of Enoch, Jubilees, Fallen Angels, um, Messianic Festivals. Some of these deal with some of the ancient uh, things like that. Anyway, we'll be downstairs if you have any other questions. I think our time's just about up. And um, other books there. That's a basic understanding of creation history, going along with creation science. There are a lot of historical documents, and there's a lot more out there than we even know. So trust the scriptures and use these things to try to witness to people. Thank you for having me.